thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, give this address on the overview of the Indian economy. Uh, I'm Rakesh Mohan. I'm president and distinguished fellow of the Center for Social and Economic Progress. Um, let me uh, first start uh, uh, by talking about the global economy. And the key point uh, really is that this actually pervades uh, uh, the whole current uh, economic situation uh, that um, the world has probably not seen as much current uncertainty uh, about the future, especially the short term future, but also to some extent the medium term future um, for at least half a century. Um, we have gone through the North Atlantic financial crisis in 2008-9 uh, uh, and other disturbances in the world like the 73-74 oil crisis. But the concatenation of events that has taken place in the last uh, few years makes the current uh, time uh, particularly exceptional. Um, first, uh, the, the, the COVID uh, outbreak, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which has lost the world economy at least two years of economic growth. Uh, second, the, the Ukraine war, which has uh, resulted in a large number of uh, supply chain disruptions, resulting in inflation, etc. Uh, third, uh, as a consequence of the COVID crisis, the, um, uh, the excessive fiscal stimulus that took place all across the world, but especially in the advanced uh, leading economies, uh, along with uh, uh, almost unprecedented uh, monetary stimulus, has given rise to inflation that the world has not seen uh, for almost 50 years since the, uh, or 40 years since the late 70s, early 80s. So uh, this is a very unprecedented situation uh, on a number of counts. Uh, one, that uh, the uh, inflation that uh, the world is, I'll come through to some numbers on inflation later, but the kind of inflation that is currently raging, and I'm using the word raging uh, advisedly, uh, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, um, has come after uh, 20 years at least, of very low inflation, uh, of around 2% or less. Um, and that uh, has made the world uh, uh, very complacent about inflation. When the large fiscal and monetary stimuli were done in 2020, 2021, uh, going on to 22, um, that there wasn't a concern with inflation. And when the inflation came, it was thought to be transitory. And the point I'm making here is in terms of the unprecedented uncertainty that in a sense, the world or the advanced economies, the policymakers really are not clear on what to do about the inflation. Is it transitory? Is it permanent? Is it uh, lasting? Is it resulting from fiscal monetary stimuli? Is it resulting just from the Ukraine war uh, induced uh, supply disruptions, etc.? And of course, the debt levels have increased tremendously on top of everything that happened after the North Atlantic crisis of the 2008-9. So I wanted to give this introduction uh, before starting off on the Indian economy in particular. But uh, given that the whole world uh, after globalization is interconnected, that India can't be uh, uh, separated from, can't be decoupled from the rest of the world, even though we have clearly done and coped with COVID much better than certainly almost all the advanced economies, and also, I think, among the emerging markets. OK, so uh, as uh, this chart uh, shows, the IMF has been consistently bringing down their projections uh, of growth, say, starting in October 2021, uh, for 2022, and all these are calendar years, and also for 2023. So uh, whereas in, uh, a, year, a year ago, um, the IMF had expected global economic growth to be around 4.9%. Um, it has uh, now come down to 3.2%. So that's a huge difference in, uh, ex in, in projection done by uh, experts at the IMF. They have uh, very sophisticated economic models. Uh, I can tell you since I was at the IMF on the board that a great deal of work goes into this, but this uh, uh, reduction within a year of expected growth from 4.9 to 3.2 tells you how much uncertainty there has been in the world. For next year, 
uh, last year they expected uh, uh, 3.8 3 uh, and now they're expecting 2.7. Once again, just within a year, to have this change in expectations is really very, very large. And uh, this, this is very interesting in some sense from our Indian point of view, that very often uh, one reads in the media that the RBI has changed its projection, the finance ministry has changed its projection, uh, etc., and of course other agencies, and they say, look how bad, how bad our forecasting is. And I think that if you, uh, if you compare this with, in some sense, the uh, most uh, advanced, uh, most technical agencies in the world, uh, it just illustrates the main point I was making a little earlier, which is very, very high uh, levels of uncertainty that are pervading uh, the global economy. Now, just starting from the largest economy in the world, that is the US economy, it has been slowing down. Um, and once again, uh, the expectations uh, uh, of, of growth have been uh, marked downwards on a sort of consistent basis. Um, and uh, also the unemployment rate. Uh, now, one of the issues about unemployment uh, rate is that uh, because of the very high inflation, uh, which was around 9% a month ago, now it has most recently come down to 82 or thereabouts, um, the uh, monetary policy tightening uh, has, uh, has been going on. And uh, the, the question, of course, this started very late because the U.S. Federal Reserve thought in 20, till uh, early 2022 that this inflation was transitory. Uh, because of its persistence, a view is now changing uh, that is perhaps not transitory. And so there is an issue. How, how much will have, they'll have to continue raising interest rates to slow down the economy and therefore reduce uh, inflation. Uh, Larry Summers, a professor at Harvard, former US Treasury Secretary, uh, has in one of his articles or a couple of his articles said that he doesn't think that inflation will start coming down and be sure of reaching the US uh, inflation target of around 2% um, until unemployment goes up to 7.5. And this is very important. Those are not my projections, those are his that as you can see in the chart, current uh, 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 unemployment rate uh, in, in, in the US uh, is 3.7%, uh, which is much below in some sense the uh, accepted kind of normal rate of unemployment, which is around 4% for the US. So the labor market is still very tight in the US. And the implication of this for us is that if Larry Summers and uh, other people of similar view are correct, then the uh, tightening of monetary policy will have to continue for quite some time. And the question, of course, is that uh, will the political acceptance of uh, raising uh, unemployment to around 7, 7.5% or even much higher than 5% for that matter. And especially as uh, the US uh, goes towards this election year of 2024, as, uh, as we will as well. Um, the second uh, issue for the global economy, again, which affects us, uh, I just want to again mention that if the monetary policy tightening in the U.S. continues in the way it has been this year, then uh, it will have impact on us in terms of uh, capital outflows because as the U.S. interest rates go up, uh, there's a flight to safety and we will see uh, either uh, foreign portfolio and foreign domestic investments slowing down or an actual outflow as has already happened uh, this past year. Um, as I said, the second issue for the global economy, which again, ex uh, uh, which again affects us, is that the world export to GDP ratio, um, which had gone up to around 31% uh, towards the end of the, uh, the 2000s uh, decade, uh, until the North Atlantic financial crisis, uh, is now down to around 27% uh, or thereabouts, 27 to 29% because um, there is with the COVID uncertainty, the COVID impact of global economy, uh, one is not quite clear on what it will be once there is normality in the world. But nonetheless, the IMF projections suggest that, that the um, uh, world export to GDP ratio will remain where it is roughly now. So what, what that means is that the growth will, will, will not be very different from the GDP growth. Um, and given what we've seen in terms of expectations of GDP growth, you don't expect high trade growth. And again, given the Indian record of uh, exports, we are pretty much coincident with how the global trade uh, works. 
and so that if there is this kind of global uh, trade decline, that will affect us as well. So let me just summarize uh, what I've just said. One, the global economy is slowing down. The US economy as well as the European economy faces the risk of recession. And given that the advanced economy is a large weight in the, the global economy, it affects everyone else. And uh, uh, going forward, um, although global trade is projected to stabilize after almost a decade of a declining trend, that it still means that it will be slow growth, which again affects us in terms of the prospects for exports. I should say here that I have talked about the US and Europe, even though I didn't show you any data on Europe. But uh, what is also the case is that uh, although uh, the, the countries to the east of us, that is Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, will continue to grow faster than the rest of the world, but they will also slow down. But they will certainly be continuing to grow faster, significantly faster than the rest of the world. And uh, therefore, in some sense, looking at our exports in the future, we need to uh, focus much more on to the east of us. Let me just talk a bit about the growth inflation dynamics. First, um, uh, I hope that this chart is visible to you all. You will see India circled. And this is essentially the initial fiscal expenditure uh, and foregone revenue, as has been estimated uh, uh, by different people, uh, as a percent of GDP. So uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, um, if you take both the actual initial ex fiscal expenditure on, because of COVID 2020, 2021, um, and the advanced economies, which are all on the right hand side, um, the US and the UK actually was more than 20%. But if you just take the fiscal deficits of the advanced economies, uh, that is US and Western Europe, um, it's almost 10% of GDP. Um, we were uh, much more prudent than these other economies, partly because we didn't have enough fiscal space. Although it can be argued they didn't have much fiscal space either, because the debt GDP ratio has now gone up to over 100% in many of these uh, advanced uh, economies. Uh, I have to say mea culpa in the sense that in 2020, when we had no idea that the COVID would last as long as it did, uh, I was in the United States at that time in March 2020 when uh, the COVID lockdown the set started in the US and elsewhere in the world, and of course ours happened as well, that at that time uh, one never imagined that this will continue for two years plus. And so in that sense one felt at that time that the, that the government of India should have done more of a fiscal stimulus. Uh, but in retrospect, I think that they were, they were uh, prudent to be prudent, uh, and that has served us well. In, in, and, and by the way, and it, it's also been true of most emerging markets. And as a consequence, um, the inflation uh, has been much higher, which is very, very unusual. It's almost always been the case that inflation in advanced economies has been lower than emerging markets and developing countries, but it's the opposite right now, and it's partly a result of the much lower fiscal stimulus that has been given uh, by uh, emerging markets. Um, so, uh, so that is one positive thing uh, for emerging markets in general, and uh, India in particular. For India, the, uh, we, we had been growing at a certain growth path uh, before, uh, before the pandemic. And what this chart shows is that uh, if we projected in 2019-20, uh, where we would be in uh, financial year 22-23, that is now, uh, if we had continued the same kind of growth that we'd had in the previous uh, 10 years or so, then the level of the GDP uh, today of the total economy would have been maybe 15% or something higher than it is today, even though we have recovered relatively well from the depths of the COVID uh, year in, 20, uh, in, in financial year 20, 2021. So uh, this is something that, that, that is, is, is for the whole world actually, and certainly for us, is something that will never be recovered. Uh, that even if we grow somewhat faster than what we were from 2012 to 2020, even then it'll take quite some time to catch up. But the likelihood is that we won't grow that much faster in the medium long term because of the overall global slowdown that I've already talked about. Um, in, among the positive things, um, as I think everyone knows, 
and certainly uh, this group uh, at True North, that um, one of the things in which India is just about the best in the world is the digitization of our payment system um, and the outreach of the whole financial system towards the less well-off and access to financial services. So that electronic transactions have been growing uh, very significantly on a regular basis. Uh, and to some extent, this was also helped uh, by COVID in, because everyone was uh, confined at home because of lockdown and so on. So many more people took electronic transactions. Uh, it remains to be seen uh, how this will continue. But nonetheless, what is clear is that India has almost better technology than almost anyone else in terms of financial transactions being electronified and everyone with a smartphone having access to that. Second, um, the uh, reform that was done a few years back on bringing a countrywide VAT, what we call uh, GST, the goods and sales tax uh, system, uh, collection growth continues and the system operates as, as we expect it to. Uh, this will certainly help us in our uh, revenue collection and revenue growth. I would say here, however, that uh, this would be even better if we simplified the GST uh, system by uh, uh, reducing the number of rates and perhaps as uh, Dr. Vijay Kilkar has been suggesting, who's among the original thinkers on the GST system, that uh, if we should reduce them at least to two rates, uh, but possibly one rate, and I think that would simplify matters greatly and aid in future uh, tax revenue collections. The uh, expectation uh, for the Indian economy's GDP growth for fiscal year 22-23, in which we are, uh, was around 7.2%, uh, certainly 7% plus at the beginning of the year. And as I mentioned earlier, that all agencies have been uh, tramping down their projections for 22-23 over the last 12 months. So uh, this shows the range of the expectations now for fiscal year 22-23. There is just one outlier that is UNCTAD and it's not clear to me why they are such an outlier. But as you can see here, that uh, the, the probability growth uh, that will actually happen in, in fiscal year 22-23 will be somewhere between 6.5 and 7. Uh, I myself don't like to put a, a more precise uh, estimate for the expected growth, just because, again, of the uncertainty that I talked about earlier. It seems to me that the best forecasters can do now is really to give this kind of range, say 6.5 to 7, uh, for uh, fiscal year 2020, 2023. And that would certainly be among the best, if not the best, in the world, and particularly for a large economy. Uh, the inflation rate in India, as all of you know, uh, has been uh, somewhat uh, uh, elevated for some time. It's actually been around 6% uh, plus minus for actually not just the last couple of years, but somewhat longer, in fact. Um, and uh, there has been some moderation in October 2022, but let us see what happens uh, in the future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, given our much lower level of fiscal stimulus, although we did have as much of a monetary stimulus as many of the advanced countries, um, our inflation, I think, has uh, been much more stable than that uh, in advanced economies, um, and still over 6%, uh, nearer, uh, uh, nearer 7%. Um, but I do think that um, this, will, this will possibly stabilize, and particularly if global inflation starts coming down. People often ask in this that, look, uh, will the Reserve Bank continue increasing the policy rate? I, of course, have no idea what they will do. The only comment I would make there is that at present, the policy rate is still lower than the inflation rate. In other words, our policy rate is still negative in real terms. Of course, it's much, much more negative in real terms in the advanced economy of the United States, Western Europe, etc. So again, uh, we are much better off in, in there. And uh, it, it, when, when people get worried about uh, monetary, that interest rates increasing to slow down, yes, of course, it will have some slowing down effect. The only thing I would say is that as long as the, the interest rates, say, on government bonds or corporate, major corporate bonds and lending, 
as long as the interest rate is lower than the, the nominal interest rate is lower than the nominal growth rate, if you expect the nominal growth rate to be something in the order of 12 to 13%, that is say 6.5% inflation, 6.5% growth, uh, 13 real growth, so about 13% nominal growth of the economy, then um, even if the lending rates increase to uh, 9, 10% or something, of course one wouldn't expect the yields on, on government securities uh, to reach that level, they'll perhaps be around 7, 8, 8% or thereabouts, 8, 8.5% at the most if, if we keep monetary tightening, that's still much lower than uh, the normal uh, GDP growth rate. So I think that uh, the RBI still has room to increase rates. One benefit of that would actually be to savers. The, one of the things that has happened uh, in recent years is that as inflation uh, has been high, earlier as inflation was low, that deposit rates came down very significantly. So that you really can't get a positive real interest rate on bank deposits today, even for a 10-year bank deposit or five-year bank deposit. Uh, the consequence of that is that, I will just show in a, in a couple of minutes, that the growth in deposits has come down. And that means that, that if, if, the, if, the, if actually the interest rates don't increase to fixed deposits in banks, then there will be a shortage of deposits relative to uh, growth. And I'll come back to that uh, in a couple of minutes. But first, just on the uh, uh, drivers of inflation, again, I think all of you would know this, that given the high weight of food uh, and, and beverages in our consumer price index, that's a significant contributor to our inflation. And uh, at the same time, I think that what has been happening is that the core inflation also has been somewhat uh, stable and robust. So whereas I wouldn't expect inflation to go up in the near future, but uh, whether it comes down or not will depend really on global uh, circumstances, particularly in the oil prices and other commodity prices. So the key message is uh, India's GDP is still below uh, the pre-pandemic level and certainly below the trend of uh, uh, of the pre-pandemic growth rate. Um, the high some high frequency indicators suggest a slowing down of uh, the growth in the second quarter, the results which we'll have uh, in a couple of days. In fact, the results will be out by the time you see this presentation. So you'll have to, you'll be better informed than I am uh, because you'll see this presentation after the second quarter results coming out. Um, we expect uh, the, this fiscal year's growth rate between somewhere six and a half to seven percent. And we'll have a better estimate, a better understanding um, uh, once this quarter's results uh, come out. Um, the CPI, uh, as I said, it is moderated in October, remains elevated, and it's still, of course, above the RBI's upper uh, target threshold of 6%. Uh, food, fuel, and core, actually all elements of the uh, consumer price index uh, continue to be uh, elevated. Coming to exports, what you can see here is the correlation between the trade deficit just due to oil uh, and the oil price index. So the oil price index is the red one and uh, the oil trade deficit is the yellow one. And what you can see in how they move uh, very, very, they're very, very coincident in terms of their movement. Uh, the non-oil trade deficit um, is uh, around 3% of GDP. So if you add up the non-oil and oil trade deficit, it's come to around 6% of GDP plus. And so we still continue to have a significant uh, 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 merchandise uh, trade deficit. Now, one thing that's very important to understand about the Indian current account, that is in India's external position, the balance of payments, that the current account balance uh, of uh, GDP as, as a proportion of GDP is, uh, has always been, except uh, much earlier in 2013-14, has been uh, always been around 2% or less as a proportion of GDP. The reason for that is that we have almost a constant source of uh, inflows through remittances from NRIs, around 3% of GDP, um, and also service exports uh, of around 3% of GDP. So that as long as the merchandise trade deficit is not much more than 6%, you have a relatively balanced uh, current account. This year, uh, it's perhaps expected to be somewhat larger, between 3 and 4% of GDP. Uh, on uh, exports, it is important to note 
that uh, the uh, growth rate of Indian exports uh, of goods and services in the last 10 years has been uh, much lower than the previous 10 years. And they've been relatively stagnant, actually, at around 1% growth only. Um, so uh, there is an issue here in terms of external balance coming in the future. One interesting thing here is that um, if you look at the chart on the left, uh, what you find is that there's a red line, uh, that there's a red dotted line, uh, which uh, says that if the real exchange rate had remained at the same level as around 2012, which is when uh, exports slowed down, um, then that's what, of course, it would have been by definition. Um, whereas, in fact, it has risen since 2012, the real exchange rate, making exports somewhat uncompetitive. And uh, on the right hand side, what you see is a projection that we have done that had the real exchange rate remained at the level, what it was 2012, 2010, 11, 12 or so, then our, uh, the, uh, then our ratio of Indian, world to, sorry, Indian exports to world exports uh, would have been higher around 2.5% as opposed to being stagnant around 2%. This is a very important point that uh, uh, the movement of the Indian real exchange rate uh, is very important along with the growth of global trade. So if the global trade is slowing down as it is, then it's more important to have realistic exchange rate. Um, and what this chart is showing is that um, uh, after the 1991 reforms, um, the, uh, the multiple of Indian export growth has been around twice that of uh, global exports. Um, it was much higher between 2003 and 10 or thereabouts. Um, and uh, now it's supposed to come down. So once again, this is telling us that we will have, that particularly if global trade is slowing down, that we will have to make a much, much greater effort in terms of making our exports more competitive. The, uh, this is also uh, shown by the exports to output ratio uh, of, uh, of, of uh, various uh, sectors um, and, um, and also comparisons uh, with, with Vietnam that uh, our, our, export, uh, our exports output ratio is much lower, which again is telling us that we have to do, make much greater effort through both uh, uh, the exchange rate, a uh, realist exchange rate, but also other measures that can promote uh, exports. Um, we've done a trend line between per capita GDP and export to GDP ratio, and you can see here that the export to GDP ratio of India is certainly significantly lower than the trend line. So, to summarize, um, services, exports, and remittances cushion the impact of uh, the current of, of the merchandise trade deficit, and also of the import of oil price shock on the current account deficit. And uh, despite uh, recent nominal depreciation of the rupee, which has given a lot of attention in the media, uh, the over, compared to 2012, uh, the real exchange rate has appreciated. Uh, and our, our estimation is that had that not happened, uh, share in global exports would have been higher at around 2.5% of global exports as opposed to what it has been at around 2% of global exports. And the India's export competitiveness, of course, has remained broadly unchanged in the last 30 years. Let me just come to perhaps something will be of more interest to this particular audience on the uh, performance of the corporate sector. So uh, as you can see here, there's that, that uh, contrary to expectations when COVID hit, um, the uh, profit after tax going up uh, for listed firms uh, very significantly. Um, and obviously, one might expect that given this kind of huge increase that you can see the gray line, that the listed firms, that might, uh, might expect they'll probably stabilize at something this level or might even come down uh, as things normalize. Uh, the unlisted firms, however, uh, their uh, uh, after tax profitability uh, has not been uh, that good and has also been much more divergent post-COVID. Uh, one of the very positive things that has happened in the Indian economy over the last uh, four, four years or so, three years or so, that uh, the uh, leverage ratio and the interest coverage ratio of non-financial firms has really improved. Uh, among the various reasons for the slowdown in the economy from 2012 to prior COVID, among the reasons was uh, the very high levels of uh, non-profiting assets uh, which led to the dual balance sheet problem, both of non, the non-financial firms' balance sheets being 
heavily hit by NPAs, by non-performance, and of course, correspondingly, uh, the hit that the financial services firms took during that period, now, a lot of that has been repaired. Um, also, we can see uh, trends of capacity utilization reaching around 70% now. Um, and so it could be that it, it, there's a reasonable possibility that uh, with the non-financial firms having deleveraged and the uh, banks uh, having taken the hit of the NPAs uh, through uh, write-offs, uh, as well as through public sector banks, the injection um, of, of, of capital, that uh, gross NPAs uh, have come down um, for, all, for, for public sector banks uh, and all banks. And so this is a good uh, uh, indication. Um, you can also see here that the banks with higher NPAs as percent of total um, have come down from over 40% of the number of banks to uh, just around 29% uh, of those, 77-29% or so. Um, and also, and you can see that on the right-hand side, that uh, the, the hit that the public sector banks have taken has uh, been improved tremendously. Um, one of the most encouraging things here, as you can see, is that the capital adequacy ratio of scheduled commercial banks uh, has, is, uh, is not very, very healthy. That is 16 to 17% on average. And what this just means is that there's far greater capacity of banks to lend for productive purposes. The, uh, and all banks now have uh, capital adequacy ratios much greater than 10%. Uh, public sector banks, of course, and private sector banks as well, those below 10% are really a very small number. Um, there's a very sharp rise in bank credit over the last year, which again, just as I said, that the kind of recovery taking place in India since uh, after COVID has, is robust. And with, the, as I said, the improvement of both the financial sector balance sheets, bank balance sheets, uh, the non-financial company balance sheets, is just showing up uh, in terms of higher bank credit and uh, assuming that there are no major shocks uh, coming, that this should continue. But I should once emphasize once again that because of the uncertainty of the global economy, we still have to be somewhat prudent, somewhat cautious in our projections, but uh, we do have a clearly more optimistic outlook than much of the rest of the world. So, and to summarize, as far as corporates are concerned, that while profits of listed com companies have surged post-COVID pandemic, those of non-listed companies have fallen. Uh, the corporate sector has continued to deleverage, so they have a much uh, greater possibility of investing uh, and borrowing. Uh, capacity utilization at around 70% is uh, very encouraging which again would mean that there will be a greater uh, tendency of uh, companies to invest. Uh, and especially because the corporate uh, tax rate was brought down a couple of years ago uh, for new investments. So uh, that I think should also help now as long as companies see demand continuing to go up. Um, net NPAs uh, are now on only 1% of net advances according to RBI's latest estimates. So a lot of the NPA problem is now past us, and the early data suggest that the COVID hasn't had as much of a impact, negative impact on bank balance sheets as might have been expected, and certainly nowhere near what happened earlier. The capital adequacy of banks is uh, very healthy indeed, and the highest since North Atlantic financial crisis. Uh, bank credit growth is accelerating, as I said. And so all of this combined improved profitability, deleveraging of balance sheets, high capacity utilization, strong bank balance sheets, all augur well for investment activity. If we come to, again, something that you all would be much more concerned with, that is Indian equity markets. Um, I have to admit, I've never understood equity markets here or anywhere else in the world. Um, but uh, what is clear is that the Indian equity market is, uh, is obviously, uh, that is the, the orange line is the Indian equity market, nifty. Uh, 50 compared to S&P 500, we are clearly doing far, far better than the United States. Because of what I said earlier, as the US Federal Reserve started increasing interest rates, there have been outflows. And so uh, that is something that we have to watch, particularly if uh, US Federal Reserve continues to raise interest rates along with uh, perhaps synchronized activity in the European Central Bank as well as, uh, 
as well as uh, uh, the United Kingdom. The one of the thing, other thing that has happened is that uh, the uh, uh, retail participation in Indian stock markets has really gone up in the last year and a half. And uh, that has compensated for the withdrawal of foreign portfolio investors. And this to some extent, this chart to some extent is explaining why the Indian stock market has been doing well relative to previous years. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier that because of uh, low real interest rates, in fact, negative real interest rates for depositors, uh, the growth in term deposits in both public sector banks and private sector banks has fallen, uh, while now, uh, as I said, credit growth has been going up. And so this is a real issue going forward, that if the uh, term deposits or the commercial banks don't increase commensurate with the demand for credit, then obviously there will be an upward pressure on interest rates, which is also one of the reasons why I feel that the RBI should continue raising the policy rate further. The right chart shows you that the real repo rate continues to be in negative territory and it has been there since uh, uh, late uh, 2019 from even before the COVID uh, crisis. So to summarize, equity markets in India have outperformed uh, the major global equity markets, uh, remain healthy. Uh, retail investors have uh, really got into the Indian stock market. Um, it does remain to be seen what they will do. Um, if uh, the uh, uh, deposit rates go into uh, real positive uh, territory and whether there will be some withdrawal from the stock markets, which of course the equity markets will be uh, impacted. And of course, if the uh, US Federal Reserve continues to increase, uh, continues to do monetary tightening, then portfolio outflows may, may continue. Um, so there is some issue here uh, that if the negative real interest rates become positive domestically if the US <coughs> monetary policy or advanced country monetary policy continues to title there'll be an outflow and therefore there could be some impact on equity markets but as I said in the beginning in the, for equity markets that this is not something I understand you will understand much better. Let me conclude by just giving some final reflections that uh, all indicators as of now is the global economy is slowing down uh, with a significant risk of mild recession in the United States as well as in Europe and the UK. So the Chancellor of the, the Chancellor of Exchequer in the UK himself has uh, uh, predicted uh, recession in the UK. So uh, the global uh, uh, headwinds uh, will, will remain difficult in the coming 12 months. Um, growth inflation dynamics uh, remain somewhat challenging in India. Uh, however, health of the Corporate balance sheets as well as the bank's balance sheets uh, suggest that uh, um, we are relatively in sweet spot relative to the rest of the world and that perhaps the growth inflation dynamics uh, won't be as challenging as they perhaps may be in some other countries. The, given the uh, somewhat tepid expectation of global export growth, we will have to work much, much harder along with the maintenance of a, of a real exchange rate uh, of a competitive real exchange rate, we will have to, do, to work much harder in uh, domestic reforms to uh, improve the competitiveness of uh, our industry. Um, the, uh, uh, I've already talked about the retail investors and whereas uh, their emergence in the last uh, couple of years has uh, provided resilience to the Indian equity market despite the withdrawal of portfolio inflows, but as I said, there is some risk going into the future that as real interest rates rise, fixed deposits for safer, safer avenues for savings, then there could be some withdrawal of retail uh, participation in the, in the stock markets and along with perhaps if, if, if the uh, foreign investors also uh, continue to withdraw. But again, I'll repeat, the confluence of strong corporate bank balance sheets, high capacity utilization and buoyant equity markets have, really do have the potential to propel investment activity going forward. Uh, I'll conclude from where I started, that is all of this is conditional in terms of the uncertainties that are prevailing in the world, whether it's due to the oil prices. Uh, in terms of oil prices, there's a reasonable likelihood that this winter oil prices may go up again uh, with the Europe tightening some uh, sanctions against Russia. Uh, and also as winter comes and demand for oil, uh, demand for energy increases, 
in the colder climates, there is a real possibility of oil prices going up and other commodity prices as well at the same time. So, uh, there, is, there remains a very uncertain outlook to the global economy which will affect us, but we will continue to be among the highest uh, growing economies in the world and the highest among major uh, global uh, economies. But that should not make us complacent. We just have to work much harder to continue the growth kind of growth rates that we ought to have. Thank you very much.